Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Zen. Really excited to have this episode with you guys today. Today, we're going to talk about David Schwartz and some of the things that have inspired him and motivated him all these years. I was just featured on, on a podcast, uh, the Zen Lounge, and there's been a lot of people. There's been a lot of people that have been coming over to my page, lots of new people that are, that are new to XRP. So I think this is a really important video to get started with when you're researching XRP to know what David Schwartz's mission is. He's the, the guy that's been, he's the CTO. Really cool guy. We're going to watch uh, a video real quick about him. great why start something else in those days the answer will surprise you and i'll tell you what originally attracted me to bitcoin was the the philosophical angle um this idea of money as a tool of sort of repression and control and doing something about that and um I saw parallels to the internet and the use of information as a tool of repression and control. You know, at one time, people in North Korea thought that Kim Jong-il was like a respected intellectual in the West and a snappy dresser and like they, they cause Wait, all really? they could hear. Yeah, because that, all they could hear is what North Korean state media was telling them. And I think one of the things that brought down the Berlin Wall was this idea that people in East Berlin wanted CD players and blue jeans and all the cool things that people in West Berlin had because West Berlin was trading with the Western world and East Berlin wasn't. I think information has been a powerful tool of liberation. And I think the Internet, in the way it's democratized information, it has gone back on that a little bit recently. But I think there was a time when it drastically democratized information information and that was a tool of liberation and i think control of money is a tool of control as well like if the government can control how you spend your money and they can inflate the currency to start wars and they have these tools they can tell when you go to a bookstore and then they can go to the bookstore and try to figure out what books you buy like controlling people's movement of money is a tool of oppressive control for oppressive money regimes money those two exactly Exactly. And I think the internet weakened their control over information and money seemed like the next thing. And if you've read, I, I wrote a series of articles about the, the war on cash talking about how governments, even in the Western world, use their ability to control money as a powerful tool of control. And the important thing is that they do it in ways that prevent people from like having due process rights. So for uh, my man, you know where I'm going with this. Example, like, you know, if you, if you all of a sudden and the IRS says you owe 50 grand in taxes, your passport's gone. Boom, you can't leave the country. Yeah. No and is there anything in that? Yeah. And if a, far, if a Middle Eastern government declares you a terrorist because you spoke out against them, you suddenly can't open a bank account like anywhere in the United States. Yeah. And this is the... This is the important thing. If the government wants to punish you for being a terrorist, they have to like try you for some sort of crime or they have to like file a civil lawsuit against you and you get to confront witnesses and you get to hear the charges against you. But if every bank refuses to do business with you because of legal risk, you ha there's no... There's no appeal process. There's no, there's no way. There's no way that you can like do anything about that. And if you can't open a bank account, I mean, there's there's stores that are cash only. Like there's places where you can't get a cup of coffee without a bank account. Yeah. And and that was what what motivated me. Um, I'm very sympathetic to regulators' legitimate concerns with things like you know radicalizing terrorists and financing terrorism and um, and and all and, and money laundering and drug money and everything. And I, and I just point out for people who might be younger, who didn't live through the internet revolution, there were those same concerns about information Were there the really? internet. What were there really? Yeah, there was a significant concern that the internet would set back the battle against uh, child sex ex sexual exploitation, and and um, there was concern that the internet was used to radicalize terrorists. There was the war over. Sorry, it's all good. There was a war over encryption where the government tried to suppress encryption for fear that criminals would be able to use encryption in the internet to coordinate their crimes and would. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Sorry, my dogs are gone. <laughs> Let me give them a minute to give them a second to calm down. Let them bark can... While you're not what? talking, if you let them bark while you're not talking, maybe the editor can like edit their voices out because he can like get them as room noise or something. Oh, what is their problem? 
They're very good. Uh -huh. I think they've stopped. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll try the, try the, let's try it again. No, no worries. Um, do you remember what, what you were talking about? Yeah. Yes, I know exactly where I was. I always forget. <laughs> So a lot of people may not remember this or maybe or may not have lived through it and so wouldn't be able to remember it, but there was a political battle over the internet, over encryption, over flow of information across borders. There was concern that the internet would set back the battle against child sexual abuse because people could exchange child pornography in ways that might be untraceable. There was a concern that the internet would be used to radicalize terrorists. Um, and governments basically found ways to address their legitimate concerns with the existence of the internet. They try to push back against the internet. There are countries that still to this day heavily restrict internet use. Um, and there, there was an attempt in the United States to prohibit the export of encryption technology. But essentially, those battles were all lost. And, the, and I think we all won as a result of that. The internet has been a tremendously powerful force that gives you know, millions of people around the world, hundreds of millions, access to the vast majority of human knowledge at their fingertips. And I think that, that we're going to, so, to some extent, repeat that story with the financial system. We are going to repeat that story with the financial system. And that sounds like that's kind of why you got involved in the industry is that you're like drawing all these parallels one to the other. Um, back then, you know, we didn't have the kind of perspective that you get looking back years later. What what we want what we wanted was we wanted everybody to have access to a financial system that worked for them we wanted people to be able to hold the asset that worked for them i think one of the biggest things was that people effectively have no choice but to hold their national currency uh, if you're wealthy and if you're in some countries that have really good financial systems it is possible to like go to effort to hold other currencies but like one of the visions was this idea that i'm a gold bug i like gold I'm, but, but I'm not going to find someone who's going to pay me in gold, and I'm not going to find a grocery store that's going to take gold. Wouldn't it be awesome if my, biz, my employer could pay me and I just got gold? And I could go to the grocery store, and I, maybe they price in whatever national currency they want to price in, but, um, but I sort of pay with gold. Um, the idea Hope you guys enjoyed the clip from David Schwartz. We're going to get back to this article. So background on David Schwartz. Uh, it's a long long video so i couldn't play the whole thing but another thing that uh another funny story about david schwartz is he actually has a lifetime ban so here's a funny story from 2019 i had to get someone else to pay my tour guide for me today and i had to pay them back in cash don't they only take paypal and i have a lifetime ban this perfectly symbolizes what has motivated me the past eight years remember i told you guys from the beginning i'm going to talk about what motivated David Schwartz? We got a lifetime ban from PayPal and he had no due process. It just one day just banned him. And this has happened to a lot of people. So PayPal ban. This guy had $5,000 frozen. I got banned from PayPal, PayPal ban. So it happened to David Schwartz too. And David Schwartz isn't just an average, average Joe. This is one of the biggest guys in the world. And he has worked with the NSA, National Security Agency. Really respected voice in the digital, community, uh, digital currency community. Recently in 2021, this is back in September, ongoing issues for David. In the next chapter of the expurating saga of my dealings with the financial system zell just decided to permanently ban my daughter for unspecified security reasons eliminating the primary way i helped her with expenses like child care during the covid pandemic thanks why is this so ridiculous either zell is right about something being suspicious or they're wrong if they're wrong obviously this is pointless because what if they're right then it makes sense right Nope, it doesn't. We'll just switch the Venmo. We are doing something bad. Any hope of catching us just dissolving as Zell will get no more information from us. So why does something this comically absurd ha absurd happen? So he's been so he has issues with Zell and PayPal now, David Schwartz. I talked about this story on 
my interview. You guys should watch it. I haven't talked about it on YouTube yet, but really good interview. I actually like it when it's different when I'm on the round table and you have the host versus actually someone interviewing you when they're asking you questions, you're able to like, you, I'm able to get more into the flow about like some of the information that I don't talk about on my personal channel. Cause it's a different vibe when people are asking me questions r rather than me hosting it, hosting an episode or, um, hosting a workshop or hosting a round table, you know, it's, it's a different vibe. So check this out on rumble. I also told them all about the Peter Thiel rabbit hole. They love that rabbit hole about Peter Thiel. The funny thing is one of the key things, cause I was telling them all the connections with Peter Thiel and XRP and, and, and Trump and all the cool stuff. I forgot them. I was on rumble for the first time. So I've never really used rumble. It's actually a really cool platform. So I was impressed. But one of the, I forgot one of the biggest connections that Peter Thiel invested and owns part of uh, Rumble now, YouTube's biggest rival. And they had Kanye West and Nicki Minaj. Remember Nicki, no, no, Nicki Minaj came out anti the, uh, the needle? So it's funny that Peter's affil affiliated with Nicki on and, uh, part of Rumble. I was like, oh, I should have told him that. That's one of the big things that I missed. So there is still so much more information. They told me they want me back on every month. They had such a good time. They took the gold pill. They got cozy. They were, they were hyped about the future. But they told me after they text me, they said, that was such a great episode. We want you on every single month. And a couple hundred people from their channels have came over to our Telegram, came over to the YouTube. So wanted to do basically retouch on this topic because one of the first things that people get worried about in, when they're investing in digital currency is this. Can their currency be stopped by a centralized overlord like David has been stopped by, let's see, PayPal and Zelle? He actually makes it a joke. Just sent an email to PayPal asking them to lift my lifetime ban. I'll report back on what they say. Ask PayPal. So he is developing the technology that PayPal will eventually use to basically run all their settlements. And he is banned. How ironic is that? It's hilarious. It's almost like it's scripted in a movie. <laughs> okay. There is currently no way to stop valid transactions from executing because the network is decentralized. Nothing stops someone from writing code that blocks transactions currently considered valid and trying to convince people to run that code. It would take convincing a majority to run that code to stop those transactions. It's not going to happen. It's fake news. It's FUD to keep you out. One other thing I wanted to show you. What did I want to show you guys? Go to my YouTube. Make sure to catch up if you're new to my previous channel because what have we been sold? There's going to be issues with the electricity, energy crisis, 10 days darkness. You've heard of all that, right? Another thing, not only is XRP going to be one of the most sensor, well, one of the only sensor resistant assets in the world. Where is it? This video is actually getting a lot of views. 3117 views. XRP does not need the internet. You do not need the internet to transact with the XRP ledger. So it's sensor resistant, does not need the internet. One of the persons I talked to was like, XRP is legit. It was like, what if they just turn the inner what if they just turn it off well you can't it's literally there's no way this is a live demo machine pump raspberry richard joining from the nether this is happening in the netherlands it's called x pop if you want to look more into it x pop offline proof of payment validation so they're going to be sharing more about it soon david schwartz NSA employee worked on the XRP ledger, also Bitcoin, banned from PayPal and Zelle, which motivated him and inspired him to make a financial system that 
works better for all. So that's it for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Peace.